Good evening, everybody. You're very welcome this evening, uh, especially our friends from across the Atlantic Ocean. Always good to see you pop up. Um, first of all, big apologies. Um, uh, Zoom snookered me and the first notice that went out was for 9 a.m. this morning, UK time. Um, I then sent out a correction, but it was nice to have a a short chat with um, my friend from the USA this morning at um, 9 a.m. for me and some extraordinary time for him. Um, anyway, apologies for that. I am, I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, as I said, welcome and also welcome to those of you who will be watching this on our um, YouTube channel. Um, Tonight, I see we've got about uh, 30 with us. There may be another 150 to 200 viewings at a later stage. So you guys are also very welcome. Um, tonight is the last um, session in this term, the first term of the Razoom. This is number eight. And we will commence on the 3rd of September with the, uh, uh, with the autumn term. And Whit Reeve is going to be addressing us um, to kick off the new term, um, high frequency active auroral research. Um, just an amazing facility that the military have handed over to the scientists and Wits has got some time for his own work. So do join us on September the 30th, um, September the 30th for that. Um, if any of you are struggling with or totally bemused by um, new radio then we do have a training workshop on September the 18th put the note in your diary if this is something that you are interested in um, tonight we've got um, uh, two posters after the main speaker um, Callum Potter and Andrew Thomas will have a uh, some time after Christian has spoken to us so tonight, I am just so pleased to introduce Christian Moinstein. Um, I, I hadn't heard of E. Callisto six months ago. That is my confession. And the last six months have been a massive learning curve for me in, in many aspects of radio astronomy. Came across E. Callisto and dropped Christian a email and I had a reply the next day, and I was just um, over, overwhelmed, to be honest. I was so pleased um, that Christian was able and uh, free to address us this evening. Um, Christian, is, uh, uh, many of you have known for uh, uh, many years, in fact, and he is a, uh, a, a professional uh, radio engineer, um, associated with um, UN, NASA, recognized around the world, um, and the uh, PI for the E. Callisto Spectrometer Network. So, um, Christian, I'm, it, it's my honor and privilege to um, hand over to you now. You're welcome to our monitors. Over to you, Christian. Okay, thank you, Paul. Good evening, everyone. Let me try to enable my monitor. Can you see what I see? The first slide of my talk? Uh, no. Oh, yet. No. Yes. No. 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 Oh. It's always a challenge. Yeah, that's. Oh, God. You have to do share my screen and then select which screen you want to share. That's the trick. That's it. Looking good. Yeah, we can see it. This one? Yep. You see the full slide? We do. You do indeed. Oh, <laughs> okay. It's a disaster all the time. So, good evening again. I will talk about solar radio astronomy tonight, this night, and 
especially about the Callisto instrument and the eCallisto network. But before I go into the details, I want to show some impressions from my recent work. I'm retired now, but I want to share some slides with you. Uh, by the way, these are the topics. So I will start with my previous work, as I mentioned before. Then uh, usually people ask, why do we need Callisto? What is it good for? I will address the key specifications of the instrument. Um, I will talk about the instrument coverage, burst type, interference issues, and um, maybe the fun part is a presentation of a few uh, instruments, not all of them. Uh, at the moment we have 173 instruments worldwide, we have not enough time to go through all of them. I will address the network structure, some user statistics, in, uh, examples of recent solar radio events, and finally, come to the conclusion. So my first activity at ETH in Zurich was Phoenix 2, which is a frequency agile spectropolarimeter at Blind Observatory. And we were observing 100 megahertz to 4,000 megahertz with the seven meter parabolic dish. Uh, on the bottom left, you see one of a, a huge event in the 90s of the last century. In the meantime, Phoenix 2 has been replaced by other instruments, but at that time it was one of the most broadband instruments. Then I was quite involved in the design, development, testing of fast Fourier transform spectrometer. And we did the testing it at Gornergaard together with people of the Cologne University. And you may see this famous mountain here, which is the Matterhorn. It was quite successful. So the telescope was observing 200 to 800 gigahertz. And the Fourier transform spectrometer was covering one gigahertz out of this frequency band. Then I was quite involved for many years in an ESA project. It was the Herschel Space Telescope. I was responsible for most of the mechanics of the receiver and also for the optics. So in total, we had in the order of 300 microwave mirrors inside of the receiver. In the meantime, Herschel has died, so the helium has gone and it's not operational anymore. I also spent many years for an ESO project, it's called MUSE, which is the multi-unit spectroscopic explorer installed at a very large telescope in Chile. So this MUSE instrument is a combination of 24 cameras and spectrographs. Uh, in total, I was responsible for one ton of optics for this instrument. And I was many years engaged with RFI monitoring worldwide. Here on this image, you see the RT32, which is a former Russian spy telescope in Latvia. And the guy on the left, that's me without helmet, without any climbing stuff, climbing to the focal plane with a spectrum analyzer in the pocket. So I'm coming to Callisto. Uh, Callisto was the Swiss contribution to IHY 2007, which was the International Heliophysical Year. And that started for us in 2006. So there was a request from NASA and the United Nations to add additional instruments to their already existing networks worldwide. So they have networks about magnetometers, um, muon detectors, whatever. And our contribution was this radio spectrometer. It was designed as a low cost instrument. And in the meantime, IHY 2000 has been closed, but it is continued under the umbrella of United Nations and NASA. It's called ISWI or ISWI, which is the International Space Weather Initiative. And Callisto has nothing to do with any moon of our solar system. It's an artificial world. Uh, the compound astronomical low cost, low frequency instrument for spectroscopy and transportable observatory. Let me go to the technical aspects. So the, the native frequency range is 45 megahertz to 870 megahertz. Of course, if you switch in a heterodyne down converter, you can observe any other band above this frequency range. Or if you insert an uh, up converter between the antenna and Callisto, you can also observe lower frequencies than 45 megahertz. The radiometric bandwidth is fixed by a ceramic filter, 300 kilohertz. And the integration time is one millisecond 
per spectral pixel. Dynamic range is in the order of 40 dB, somewhat more. Noise figure of the instrument itself is less than 10 dB. That means you need a low noise amplifier to get the sensitivity which is required to do solar burst observations. The measuring rate is fixed to 800 frequencies per second, which can be divided, for example, 200 frequencies um, four times a second or 100 frequencies eight times a second. That depends on the observer what the time resolution he wants to have. The cost of the instrument is in the order of $500. And the output of the instrument is FIT files. FIT means flexible interchange transport. So this type of file does not only contain the data, it also contains uh, the x-axis, the y-axis, and some additional information, such that any time all the required information can be read out from this file. The instrument, which you can see here, is a printed circuit board, Europe format, and contains 221 components. Probably you cannot see them, but most of the SMD components are underneath, while the big components are on, on the upper side of the board. Uh, this sketch has been drawn by Witham Ree from Anchorage. Thank you, Wit, <laughs> for this. I don't have such nice tools. So just a quick uh, go around. The main, let's say the main component is a Philips tuner, which was used for TVs earlier times. Nowadays, you can hardly get these kind of tuners because nowadays everything is digital. But this tuner is one of the last where you can get analog signals out for further um, <clears throat> processes. The IF frequency, which is coming out from tuner, is in the order of 36 megahertz. So then we go first to a down converter and mixer circuit such that we can bandpass filtering at 10.7 megahertz. Then we have an additional IF amplifier, and then we go to logarithmic detector. Logarithmic detector was chosen such that we can cope on one hand with strong RFI, and on the other hand with weak solar radio bursts such that we can measure both strong and weak signals with only eight bits of the A to D converter from this chip AT Mega Mega 16. Uh, this processor controls the tuner via I square C bus. So every frequency is sent to the tuner in a sequence. And on the same time, we can change or adjust the gain of the tuner. For example, if we have high level of interference, we have slightly to reduce the gain. While if we are on a very remote place with no or low RFI, we can increase the gain and then we gain some sensitivity of the complete system. And uh, this circuit here allows to external clock the system by a GPS system or any other process clock. But per default, the system is clocked internally with a quartz. And then we have a FPU buffer. FPU means focal plane unit. This uh, eight, no, it's six bits allows to switch to other antennas, to switch polarization, to switch calibration sources, whatever. And this, this interface AIA232 is the connection to the computer, notebook, laptop, whatever. The very, very basic system looks like this. <clears throat> so of course we need an antenna, the bigger the better, and a low loss coaxial cable to the spectrometer, Callisto. And we need a computer, usually a Windows compatible computer. It also runs on Linux, but I have to tell you, if you use Linux, you don't see anything. The Windows application on a Windows computer allows you to observe in real time dynamic spectrum, light curve, and additional information. While on Linux, you don't see anything, but it produces data. It depends on the application. If it's on a very remote uh, place where nobody's around, Linux is fine because nobody's there to, see, to watch real time information. But if you want to see something, or if you want to make a demonstration or training for students, you should go for a Windows system such that you can see and observe all the information which is available. So this, this type of configuration we have on several places, especially in big towns where there is a high level of interference. Then we cannot work with the low noise amplifier because they are saturated and produce uh, um, 
cross modulation and saturation effects. So the, the majority of the instruments looks like this. So of, of course we need an antenna again, and we have then a low noise amplifier. Low noise means in the order of less than one dB noise figure. The gain should be in the order of 20 dB. For remote places, if there is a lot of RFI around, I suggest to have a low noise amplifier with a gain in the order of 10, 13 dBs. And usually we supply these RNAs via the coax. Therefore, we use a bias T to feed in the DC into the coax and for the LNA. <clears throat> and it's obvious the coax L1 between the antenna and the low noise amplifier should be as short as possible and it should be of loss, low loss type. Coverage. Here you see a plot from two days ago. Um, there are red dots. Red means they're active, they're hot, they're providing data. We have some orange dots, uh, one in India. This means they have provided recently data, but do not provide data today. And there are many, many blue dots. Blue dots means they are cold, they do not provide data. And there are many reasons not to provide data. So one reason is loss of motivation. That happens very often. <laughs> then, especially in the a region of Ethiopia, here Addis Abeba, here Mekele, they have a war and the internet was switched off and also no power. So people there are starving without internet, without food, without power, which is really a disaster. Then there are other places, for example, Pakistan, they do not want to provide data for political reasons. Then we have uh, an instrument in Greenland, which is blue, they, they have lost power. And it takes months until someone gets there to, to check the issue and to, to switch on the power again. So that's one reason why we have so many instruments. Uh, at the moment, we have 175 instruments worldwide distributed. And on that, on this day, 65 instruments were providing data. So about one third of the instruments is really providing data to the network. If I'm talking we, then I mean with Reef in a grid. He is quite busy also with these activities. So but what do we observe? Here is a plot with six examples of the major types of solar radio bursts. If I start top left, this is called noise storm or type one burst. The duration of this burst can be seconds up to hours, sometimes even days. And we know they are very often strongly circular polarized. Uh, usually a frequency range in the order of 100 to 300 megahertz. Then I guess this is the most important burst type, type two. In this case is a burst type with split band. Uh, this burst type, we use to derive the radial velocity of a CME from the sun outwards. CME is the coronal, coronal mass ejection. And from the de delta frequency versus delta time, we can derive directly the velocity of the CME. And even more interesting, if this is a split band, as shown here, we have two bands of the type two, this allows to derive the magnetic field at the shock wave of the CME. So there's a lot of physical information inside of this type two burst. It's the one which is mostly used by the solar physicists and the scientists. Then number three is type three. I call it an isolated type three. In fact, these are two. Uh, quite a rare burst is type four. It's a wide band burst, can also duration hours, sometimes days and it can cover many hundred megahertz. Then the next one we call type five. It looks like a flag. In fact, it's very similar to type three here, but this, this flag is typical for type five. Don't ask me about the, the physical background. I'm, I'm not a solar physicist, so I'm mainly interested in the instrumentation. Then a very rare burst type is the U-burst. So in this case, there were particle particles 
accelerated away from the sun, but finally gravitation win the competition, the particles fall, felt back in the magnetic field of the sun, and therefore we have this U-type or V-type burst. I already mentioned a few times RFI interference. Here we see a plot which was taken in 2006. Uh, at this time, Switzerland changed from analog TV to digital TV. We see here the red plot, uh, digital TV, which tells me that I cannot do any solar observation between 550 megahertz and 575 megahertz. In previous time, when we had analog TV, we could still do observations between the carriers from the different analog TVs, even between uh, the sound and image carrier. But nowadays with the digital TV, we cannot do any observations inside of the band, which is occupied by digital TV. At that time, if you looked at the green plot that was India, they have still analog stuff. So there are a lot of channels available for astronomical observations. And even much better, Badari, which is in Russia, in Siberia, the blue plot here below, there is no interference at all. So they got really nice results in 2006. In the meantime, of course, everybody has uh, one, at least one mobile phone in his pocket. They have TV, they have radio. radio in the car at home and everywhere. So also in Siberia, the level of interference is quite high. So we'll show you four examples. Interference is also a measure of population. So if I start top left, this is uh, Los Molinos, which is near the main town Montevideo in Uruguay. And you see this blue plot, there is no baseline. Maybe they could do some observations here around 600 megahertz. But all the rest is much, much stronger than any solar radio burst. So there's no chance to do any observations in Montevideo, Uruguay. Then the one on the right is from Malaysia next to Kuala Lumpur. Of course, we see also strong FM transmitters around 100 megahertz. They have some analog TV channels, but there is still a gap between about 250 megahertz and roughly 400 megahertz, where they can do nice solar burst observations, at least at that time when the image was taken. Then a very good place was in Ireland in the Glendalough National Park. When I was there with an antenna and a spectrometer, the, the ranger came and said to me, oh, you." you are not allowed to do measurements in the national park. So I was thrown out and then I asked you why. I just collect photons. It's the same as with my digital camera. No, you are not allowed to do any measurements. <laughs> so at least I had sufficient data to produce these plots, but uh, of course there's no observation possible. And uh, the last example is from our own observatory. It's called Blyen, which is more or less in the center of Switzerland. Of course, we have FM radio. We have some digital audio broadcast and in the meantime, some digital video broadcast, but still there are gaps where we can perform solar radio burst observations with, with a, let's say, acceptable level of interference. Now I'm coming to a few examples of Callisto stations. Again, not all of them. So in outside of Switzerland, I started in India. This is Uti with a 500 meter cylinder parabolic antenna. They do um, pulsar pulsar measurements and uh, interplanetary scintillations. And <clears throat> beside this cylinder parabola, they erected a logarithmic periodic dipole array on an old trunk of tree, just old wood. And they nailed their dipoles onto this wood coax cable to the spectrometer and they get quite nice observations because Uti is in the mountains, so they are shielded from surrounding big towns. So the level is quite low of interference and they get nice results. For example, this one. So this is a type three burst, which was the first light in Uti. And usually if we have an astronomical first light, we also have a gastronomic highlight. This is the Indian food from Uti. 
Then one of the next station was in Gauri Bidanu. This is roughly in the center of India. They host a heliograph between 40 and 150 megahertz composed out of 384 LPDAs on a distance of 1280 meters times 441 meters. So it's a T-shaped interferometer, which they use for real-time imaging of the sun at low frequencies. And one of these, you see, may see the, all these antennas behind, and this antenna in front was then switched off from the interferometer and used for the Callisto, which you can see here on the left of the monitor. And one of the first light was a typical type two burst, which again allows us to derive the velocity of the CME. And uh, this was the gastronomic highlight. Then during winter season in December, I was in Siberia. It was pretty cold. Uh, the instrument belongs to a university in Yakutsk, Russia. Uh, they have 100. 28 dishes in the frequency range from two to nine gigahertz, distributed about over a distance of 622 meters. And one of the dishes, as you can see here, was misused as a cracking system for the LPDA. So this is the only system where the polarization changes during the day. And here you see Sergey and Andre, which take care of the instrument. Callisto is somewhere here left of the computer. And when I was there, I was shocked when I saw these bursts. My impression was first, oh, the system instrument is broken. There's some loose contact in the antenna or in the cable. No, in fact, it was a very dedicated type of burst. So it started with type three bursts here. We have type two bursts here and we have microwave pulsations here. So there was a combination of all burst types within 15 minutes of observation. This is very rarely the case. Usually you have one burst type within 15 minutes. So everybody was happy about these results and they still have very good results in Siberia, although the RFI is increasing, of course. <clears throat> Another nice exotic place is Mauritius. They were hosting an interferometer at 150 megahertz to map the southern sky. And the size of the interferometer is two kilometers by one kilometer T shape. And in the, it was in the 70s when the copper price was high. People have stolen all the coaxial cables from the antennas to the receivers and they would have to spend millions and millions of dollars to replace the cables, which the University of Mauritius cannot afford. So all these helical antennas are useless at the moment. And then they simply erected a LPDA on an old eucalyptus tree supported by sanitary tubes such, such that the dipoles don't bend. Uh, the LPDA was designed for 20 to 150 megahertz, and they still get quite good results because Mauritius has low industry. And <clears throat> this Prado Poste Flag is a bit away from the main city, so the, the level of RFI is quite low. And they still get quite good results, which looks like this. So there is no interference between 45 megahertz and 180 megahertz. And here we see type three first. An even more exotic place is Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia. And you see this tiny antenna in the whole Mongolia at that time, there was no antenna available. So the university sent the guy to China to buy an antenna. And the guy went back with a simple digital TV antenna. And you can imagine this small antenna is not sufficient for solar burst observations. So if once you plan to do solar burst observation, the antenna should be a bit larger than this one. This is not sufficient. They will never see any burst. Of course, in the meantime, they have uh, built and manufactured a new antenna, which is as large as the previous one. So now they get quite good results from this location. And um, 
In the meantime, they have also a second instrument in Gobi Desert, which is even better from the point of interference. But uh, you can imagine that the Gobi Desert, the issue is power and internet. So very often there's no power and no internet. And uh, therefore we need more instruments distributed over the planet. Uh, of course, they got first results, which looks like this here. I even don't know what type of burst it is. It's complex structure, I cannot explain it. But the uh, food was very delicate. delicate. Uh, it was living under my room in the morning. Uh, the food was served in the afternoon. Uh, it, the view of this food is a bit strange, but the taste was very good. Uh, we had to use quite a lot of beer and vodka to flush it down. Then <clears throat> another exotic place is uh, Almaty in Kazakhstan in the Tian Shan Mountains, 2735 meters above sea level. This is again a former Russian spy telescope. So in the same around the 70s, Kazakhstan separated from Russia and they turned the spy telescope into a scientific telescope. The dish which you can see here is now used for, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> is used for solar flux monitoring while burst observation is done with LPDA, which you can see on the rim of the dish here, LPDA. And this is a very special LPDA. They constructed themselves completely out of titanium. So this is the only antenna which I know is made out of titanium. Usually you use aluminum, but they have a lot of military stuff around and titanium was around. Spectrum is quite clean. They have some FM uh, interference from Kyrgyzstan, some carriers here, but the majority of the spectrum is very clean. What you can see here, these are military satellites from the US. This tells me that the system is full sensitive. We see 10 dBs above background, then we know the system is working as expected. And the first light started with a type three burst here followed by a type two burst again with split band, which allows to derive the velocity of the CME and the magnetic field of the burst. And this type of food we had every day, it's called plough, made of rice and meat and <laughs> carrot. <laughs> and again, it requires a lot of beer, vodka and schnapps and wine to flush it down. Because uh, you know, two days the same food, that's okay. Three days, still okay. But one week, three times the same food, uh, it's a bit <laughs> special. Then we have an instrument in uh, Cajuero Paulista in Brazil. It's between Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. The place is also used for the Brazilian Decamet array. Maybe you can see in the background, there is a dish here, another dish here, another dish here. And beside this interferometer, they have erected this typical LPDA. There's a second one, which is not shown on the image. Therefore, they use two Callisto to observe both linear polarizations. The location is still quite good in terms of RFI, and <clears throat> they provide data to the network. First light was a noise storm, which you can see here in VHF. And the gastronomic highlight was uh, vegetable and chicken. Another place is uh, Malaysia, the National Space Center near Kuala Lumpur. And this is also very special because all the students are female. There's no male, the only male guy that's myself. All the other science solar physicists are female. It seems that they are quite interested in solar physics. The spectrum has already shown it, I've shown it in the beginning. So there's quite a lot of interference, but still they have a gap here <clears throat> where they can do observations. And also below 100 megahertz, there are still quite clean spectrum for observations. And observation again is a type two burst here. And this guy here, this is a fish. <clears throat> 
one of the most impressive places where I've been is a thunderstorm incoherent, incoherent scatter radar in Kangalusak, Greenland. Again, it was pretty cold. <clears throat> there is a dish of 32 meters diameter, and they have a transmitter of 3.5 megawatt. And the gain of the antenna is 49 dB isotropic. So you can yourself try to calculate the radiated power of the system, which is used to heat up the ionosphere and to get information about the electron density, about the velocity of the cl electron clouds, and some additional information, which honestly I don't understand. And behind this hill, we were able and allowed to set up our own antenna. It's LWA, which we got from Reef in Anchorage, just mounted on a piece of rock. And here you see this, can see the spectrum. It's super, super clean. So there was no interference at all. So we get perfect results from this location. Unfortunately, at the moment, there is no power. And it takes months to get power back because the radar facility has been closed by NSF from the US. They want to save their money for other aspects. And there is nobody around who could switch on the power again. The first light was a very nice type three burst here as a trigger of the CME. And then here we see the fundamental radiation of type two. And this is the first harmonic of the type two. And both the fundamental and the harmonic are split band, again, which allows to drive velocity of the CME and the magnetic field. And this stuff here, I only had it once, luckily, because this is whale and it tastes terrible. <laughs> so I would never eat whale again. <laughs> Another place which is now in a very, very bad situation, there is a war now at Michele which is the Tigray area north in the north part of Ethiopia. They had a very nice place with a low, low level of interference. Here you see the Callisto. This is the LNA here. Uh, but uh, no power, no internet, and people are starving. This is a very bad situation at the moment. There is an additional instrument in Addis Abeba. And uh, university and another university, they could not get an agreement who will pay for the LNAs. <laughs> Finally, they have an LNA, they have a spectrometer, they have an antenna, but they cannot agree on uh, assembling together. <clears throat> so there is a, let's say, a political issue. Then <clears throat> there is another instrument in Udaipur Solar Observatory, India. They have a nice shed, metal shed, which is ideal <clears throat> to protect from self-produced interference from the computers. And here in the background, you see a self-produced LPDA, <clears throat> and they get quite good results from this location. And very spicy food, of course. <clears throat> yeah, then you know the story about Arecibo. I have been there just a few months before it crashed. I was even climbing around this focal plane. We were allowed to enter the cabin of the focal plane and the receivers. But the main activity was to set up LWA, which was successful. It's now installed in the grave area of the big dish. And it's not operational at the moment because they, you know, they have other issues than just trying to keep this LWA operational. But uh, at that time we had it working. So this on the very left side, you see the, uh, the quadrature coupler and power coupler from WIT. These two guys are heterodyne up converter to shift the low frequency up into the native frequency of Callisto. And here we see two Callisto spectrometer. Unfortunately, we cannot see the image, but uh, we were successful, as you can see here, there were some type three bursts, a group of type three bursts. So the system is very sensitive. There is not, a, there is quite a low level of interference or was, it's even lower now because there's nothing else than just this instrument. And yeah, you are familiar with this kind of food, toast and um, eggs and bacon. <laughs> That's very common, I guess, in UK. And finally, there is an instrument in UK in, at Glasgow University. <clears throat> and I must say, 
This instrument is one of the best because it's maintained and uh, they have a tracking system. All the system which I have shown before, they have no tracking system. So they have just directed the antenna to the zenith, such they get, uh, let's say, observation time of a few hours during the meridian time. But uh, this guy here, Colin Hunter, managed to install a standard satellite rotor and he can rotate the antenna along the declination of the sun. And he just changes the, the elevation two or three times a year because that's sufficient because this LPD has a very large opening angle in elevation while the opening angle in, uh, in right ascension is small. So we have full sensitivity all over the day. Here we see type three burst and here type two burst and you know all this stuff here that's very well known. Um, yeah, then the network. The network is called e -Callisto, and the instrument again is Callisto. In Switzerland, we operate a central server at the University of Applied Sciences, Sciences and I do the control and management remotely on this server. And we have many instruments now distributed over the world in the order of 65, which provide fetch files via FTP to the central server. Now solar orbiter operations are also these data end up in this server. What we provide from all these Callisto instruments, of course, we also provide the raw files, which are the fit files. From these fit files, I generate quick views, which is an image, and I produce daily spectral overviews, which is also an image, and daily light curves. Here we see some statistical information. We have in the order of 700 visits per month from more than 100 countries. We produce in the order of 60 gigabytes of solar radio data per year, zipped format. And we have 40 terabytes available, so it should be sufficient for a couple of years. And it's hosted and maintained by the University of Applied Sciences Institute for the 4D Technologies. Always people ask me, why do you want so many instruments? I already mentioned one reason, which is RFI. Another reason is motivation, politics, lack of power, lack of internet. So the more instruments we have, the better we can get the results. What you see here is our top left, there's an observation from Burr in Ireland, Burr Castle, you may know that, from 25 megahertz to 60 megahertz. Then we have an observation from Glasgow University from 45 megahertz to 80 megahertz and not seen on, on this plot is in a third uh, observation from Belgium, 45 megahertz to 80 megahertz. What we can do with IDL or Python or any other script language, we can put all these images from different locations together to one final image such that we get full information of the burst. There are several advantages because the burst, first of all, the burst is correlated in all stations. It's the same burst in all stations, while interference is not correlated. So it goes down by square root of number of instruments. And uh, the noise also goes down by square root of number of instruments. So the more instruments we can put together, the more sensitive are we getting and the most or the best overview we can get over the image. So again, here we see the fundamental of a type two burst again with split band, and this is the first harmonic. This, by the way, typical, the first harmonic is always stronger than the fundamental, which is the opposite from your transmitter. So if you have a transmitter, usually you want to have your, your, your fundamental the most of the power, not in the first harmonic, but in, in, in the nature, it's, it's the vice versa. versa. Uh, an example was collected in November 4th, 2015. You may have read that in the newspaper. So Swedish airports had been shut down for a few hours. Uh, planes which were in the air could not land. 
and planes on the ground could not start because their radar system was blind. They could not see anything. The ADSB was not working. Communication was not working. Why? What you see here is a dynamic spectrum on the x-axis you have time from about uh, 130 UT to about uh, almost four o'clock UT. And here you see frequency range from 1000 megahertz to 1250, just a piece of dynamic spectrum. This light blue is, we call it the quiet sun. So that's the, just the, the thermal radio radiation. And then at 1340, it started to, to cool, let's say, to cook. Then it was quiet again. And then suddenly at 20 past two UT, there was very strong radiation in the order of all 50 dB solar ray, solar flux units. And none, none of the receivers, none, no radar receiver, no communication receiver, no GPS system is designed for such a high level of interference. So this, and then people thought, oh, this must be the Russians jamming Sweden. But finally, we, of course, we could prove it's not the Russians which produced this high level of RFI, it's naturally produced by the sun. And this is very dangerous situation. You imagine nowadays we have these Tesla cars, which are fully automatic driving on the highway. And I'm not sure what will happen if there is a roundabout or an accident, if GPS is not working for an hour. So <clears throat> this is really an issue. And therefore many scientists have started now to study this space weather to understand the situation in this case, and hopefully in the future to do some forecast. But I know it's quite difficult because it's up to now we cannot forecast this kind of high level of interference. And there was another case in, uh, what was it? In, I don't know, 2017, same frequency range now from 1000 to 1600 megahertz. And you see again, ADSB from planes is saturated. Many radar frequencies are saturated and uh, frequencies for GPS, GLONASS and all the other satellite system are inter at least interfered. And I was talking with a helicopter pilot from Greenland. He was approaching the airport following the uh, IL instrument landing system ILS. And the ILS system had green light, which means he was on the track to the airport. But then he was looking out of the window, there was no airport. And the reason was the radiation from the sun was so strong that the ILS system had completely saturated and finally get green light for the pilot, which is again, very, very dangerous. So people have to really take care about solar activity. So finally, I have done nice instruments with my students we went to the mountains in January. It's called Diavoleza. It's about 3,000 meters above sea level. And we have set up a small interferometer with two Wi Fi antennas, this kind of grid type antennas, at a distance of about eight meters. And one a total power system. So the, both antennas were just added together and fed into a callister. And then they get this type of fringe pattern, or here which allows them to derive the diameter of the sun, even if you cannot see the sun. So if we have rain, if we have snowfall, if we have fog, we cannot do optical observations, but we can still do radio observations and use this type of information to derive the diameter of the sun, which is a very nice student's instrument, uh, student's experiment or project for one week. I'm already coming to the conclusions. So the network is still growing. Uh, at the moment, we, I have requests from Azerbaijan. There was a war recently, so we have problem. Cote d'Ivoire in African continent, Ecuador, Nigeria, Cuba, Oman, Azores, Paraguay, Egypt, and Ethiopia are still on the again agenda. Um, from my point of view, the geographical coverage should be improved, especially in the American Pacific region. 
because most of the instruments are not working for many different reasons. Uh, positive aspect is data quality is improving, so people go through a learning process. But on the other hand, the RFI situation is getting worse, and the, the gradient of RFI is steeper than the gradient of the learning process. So at the moment, it seems that RFI is winning the competition. It's getting worse every day. And uh, therefore, it's important to have many instruments such that we can pick out those spectrum which are still okay for scientific analysis. And of course, more science could be done, should be done, but this is mainly an educational problem. We try by United Nations and NASA to solve that problem, but it's just a piece of raindrop which we can provide one week training in India or in African continent. It is not sufficient. So maybe one or the other from you guys is interested to train some students in radio physics and radio astronomy. My problem is there's no funding available because I'm retired, so I cannot apply for funding. So I have either to pay for myself or the university or the school has to pay for. And many universities in the African continent, Asia, they have no money for instruments, which is a big issue, of course. And finally, every information about hardware, about software, free access to the data, you can get about e calistaorg and we are also on Facebook. Thank you very much for your attention. Paul, take over. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so much, so much, so much to think about. Um, I, we, we've got some time for some questions. Um, maybe I'll kick off. My, my privilege is I'm in the chair. Um, Christian, has anybody done any uh, work with the data to correlate the data from the solar spectrometer with, for example, uh, X-ray data from GEOS and uh, geomagnetic data? Uh, I'm aware of correlation between radio and X-rays. That's, let's say, the common procedure for students. Um, about magnetic effects, I'm not aware of. Maybe they exist, but at least I'm not aware of. Um, there's a correlation with other things, uh, some strange things, but uh, <laughs> I will not talk about it. Uh, or let's say alternative physics. But uh, X-rays, that's the majority of the papers which are published together with radio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, yes, please. Um, you mentioned that briefly, and I, I think I've heard elsewhere that the the filter that you use in Ecolisto isn't um, available to buy anymore. Are you, or is anybody looking at a substitute for it, or can you still get them on get you them on mean eBay? The, the ceramic filter, three hundred kilowatts. Hmm. No, I can still get them in Switzerland from Conrad. Maybe yeah, I, th I think you mean the front end uh, uh, module, the tuner module, don't you, Andrew? Yeah, the, yeah, ah. the, 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 is it a Philips? The Philips tuner. Uh, you can get them on eBay. They're still available, or were still available on eBay. I also bought mine on eBay, about 70 or 80 pieces. I still have about 20, so it's a... <laughs> <laughs> might be sufficient for the next two, three years. But these two, they are not officially available. Mm. Um, so that means sooner or later, someone has to do a redesign of this kind of spectrometer. I mean, you all know these SDRs, which are very nice and super cheap. But all these SDRs only cover maybe two, three, four, some 10 megahertz which is not sufficient for solar burst observation. You need hundreds of megahertz. And uh, if you want to go for a professional system, which is a fast Fourier transform spectrometer with one gigahertz bandwidth, this costs in the order of 100,000 uh, pounds or euros or whatever. Cannot be afforded by, by students or schools. So mm. 
for, let's say, people with low budget, the frequency agile spectrometer is still the simplest solution. Um, in fact, you can also use SDRs to step through frequencies, but they are not as fast as these TV tuners. So it requires quite some design studies to find a solution which can cover hundreds of megahertz in one sweep and does not cost more than, let's say, $500. Mm. Um, I've got a quick, okay, go ahead. Maybe I can um, add a little bit to that question. I'm, I'm involved or casually in, uh, involved in a program looking at high bandwidth uh, digitization and processing. And there are some approaches with uh, more recent uh, A to D converters and uh, stuff where it might be possible to go into the, let's say 200, 300 megahertz bandwidth range at relatively moderate cost. And when I talk about relatively moderate cost, we know $500 because there's a lot of interest in for various types of experiments to do that. Um, it's not, not done yet. Um, the people are working on it, but I think it's looking promising. So eventually this kind of equipment, um, at least if you restrict yourself to the few megahertz uh, range, this could be an option for the future, maybe in, in another uh, one or two years. Yeah, some people started to uh, add up several SDRs, maybe 10 or 20 or even more. Um, yeah, but then you need a high speed, high sophisticated computer to collect all this data. So I don't know. I mean, it's a very, I think, I think it's still a very nice solution, this TV tuner, but there's no future. So we have to find a new solution for these kind of, of activities, wideband solar burst observation. In addition, what Wolfgang mentioned, uh, A to D convert, of course, they are getting cheaper and cheaper, but uh, in the future, we need more bits because, you know, the level of RFI is increasing. And if we do direct sampling with the A to D converter at, to, at the antenna, then we need at least 10 bits, maybe 12 bits to cope with the higher level of interference on one hand and on the other hand to get down to the sensitivity level which we need for, for astronomical observations. So as I mentioned, one of my first slide, we had this FFT spectrometer with one gigahertz bandwidth. It had eight bit, which is fine for frequencies, let's say above 100 gigahertz because there's no RFI. But if you go below a few gigahertz or even in the megahertz range with eight bits, there's no way. They're always saturated by some RFI and you don't see any weak signals in these eight bit digitizers. And the 12 bit digitizers with two giga samples per second, that's out of my budget, at least out of my budget. Maybe there are some people with sufficient budget. <laughs> I, I've got a quick question. Um, uh, Christian, uh, it's uh, finally glad to uh, see you in person. I, uh, I keep doing all your articles in the Sarah Journal and uh, so glad to see you and uh, see you live here. Um, have you been to Witt's site, uh, his Ecolisto site, and what kind of food does he uh, prepare? Uh, and uh, last thing is uh, the site you see behind me is in uh, Haswell, Colorado. Uh, we just got internet and we just got electrical power. That's how remote we are. And um, I was wondering, uh, it didn't look like you had a lot of uh, US sites. And if, if you want one, maybe we can uh, hook something up. Yeah, it sounds interesting because we have several sites in the US, but they do not provide data. I mean, there's one exception that's Witt in Anchorage. He provides a lot of data from Anchorage and from Kohoe, maybe a third one in the future. And of course, I have been there and we had some nice food and nice <laughs> drinks. <laughs> it's, I guess it's nine years ago now. Yeah, um, as I said before, the American continent is really sparsely populated with instruments and a lot of instruments are not providing data for several reasons which I explained before. So <clears throat> if, if someone wants to set up an instrument we need people who are motivated, who are interested to maintain the system. Maintenance means it's in the order of one percent 
of a day, so maybe five minutes per day, just to see is the computer working, is the internet working, do we have power, these kind of questions. And you know, several people, they don't care, they get, they get the instruments, they say, thank you for the instrument, but they put it on the shelf and it's never working. And that mainly happens on the African continent, which is really frustrating, because then I spent a lot of time and a lot of money to provide this instrument and to train people and then gone. So I really hope that we can get some people which are really interested, motivated, and also have some, some experience, you know, how end connector looks like and how a coax cable could be cut into two pieces, something like this. Uh, by the okay. way, you, you always get my money for Sarah. You are Sarah treasure. Oh, no, I, I can't, for some reason, I can't get that off. <laughs> I mean, that's, I guess that, uh, that this is the uh, the account I have to get on to do oh, the conferences, okay. and uh, for some reason it won't let me change my name today. Okay. So uh, I, I blame Paul for that. But uh, yeah, Rich Russell. Um, in case oh, sorry. You didn't know. <laughs> sorry about that. I, I have to. No, it's it. not your oh, fault. Honey. It's just that it's for some reason it won't let me get rid of the Sarah Treasure thing there. But uh, okay. uh, thank great great uh, review, uh, Christian. I think I'll get a hold of you because uh, I think uh, we're. We, we just got internet and I'm saying the site behind us, we do, uh, we got Pulsar's hydrogen. We're gonna get an interferometer up yeah. and um, and it's remote, no, very little RFI. And yeah, uh, you just we, need we can... a, good, a good antenna. Uh, ideally some more than 10 dBs of gain, which is okay. You don't need super high gain. So you don't need a 20 meter dish because you know, all these burst activities outside of the solar disk it's in the corona. So we need at least at least two degrees of opening angle. It's the minimum. If you have a half degree opening angle of from a, let's say 20 meter dish, you will miss most of the bursts. We need to see the whole sun, the whole corona. So a medium size antenna. 10, 12, 14 dB is okay. Yeah, we can organize that. And we can okay. also stay in contact with with. Oh yeah, it might be easier to get hardware. Okay. Thank All right, thanks. Welcome. Okay. Um, have you had anybody from Western Australia, the state of Western Australia, expressing yeah, I, interest? Um, there is a nice new station popped up in Assa, which, which is the Australian uh, South on something observatory. So we have two stations. Yeah, well, in Adelaide and, and Melbourne, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, it's called SA, SSA. I don't remember the... SSA. Uh, a, SSA. Uh, they have an LWA. I don't know whether it's from WIT or whether they built themselves. They get quite good results from Australia. And they have also an LPDA. At the moment, there are no bursts on higher frequencies. We're still, mm. we're still waiting for the first light. And there is another station in Australia. Um, I forgot the name. But you can see it on the website. There are two dots. Yes, in okay, Australia, I'll have a look here. Yeah. And most of the time they are active. So there's also one in New Zealand, but uh, their antenna is too small. They don't see any burst at all. It's not worth to set up a small antenna, just a digital TV antenna or just a simple dipole that doesn't work. Who could I talk to or with about um, final year university project um, possibilities? Um, data data analysis. You, you mentioned the fact that you need you would like to see much more scientific analysis of the of the data. Yeah, um, I'm thinking. I'm thinking final year undergraduate project, or possibly even masters uh, dissertation type yeah, project. That's that's per masters, uh, P no, not PhD, but master and bachelor is is perfect because yeah. there are many projects which you can done in let's say one or even four weeks. Uh, for example, RFI monitoring in a town or in a rural area, or measuring antennas, comparing antennas. Um, correlation with x-rays, for example. Yeah, okay. So 
Or, who, who can I talk to that would be? Um, you, you, you keep on saying you're not you're not an expert in these things, but <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, try to get in contact with your local university or college or. Yeah, I, I am teaching at a university. Um, oh, yeah. Then go to the physics department, talk with the teachers there. Yeah, but we're looking, you know, looking specifically for ideas coming from Callisto about what you would like to have done. Ah, there is a hmm. document on the website okay. with about twenty potential experiments which can be done with students. Excellent. Okay. If, if you just uh, go yeah. through the website, it's under documents somewhere, yeah. so you can find it. Okay. Good. Thank you. Christian, the um, the price point is very attractive for the independent researcher. Um, is there a, uh, a forum or a list server where there's a discussion to support um, new entrants to the uh, technique? Um, yeah, I, I only have this uh, Facebook site where I post some information about the instruments, about observations, about news. Um, but other than that, I'm not aware of. Maybe Wit knows about there was some some group sometime, but I don't know whether it's still alive or not. Maybe Wit can answer this question better than I. There was some some kind of group, interest group. Wit our studio there. You are muted. I was over there. Maybe he's fallen asleep. <laughs> yeah, which is still with us. <laughs> Maybe he fell into sleep. <laughs> yeah. It must be the middle of the night in Australia, isn't it? I had everything shut down here. Sorry yeah. about that. Um, yeah, at one time there was a Yahoo group for Callisto. I, I don't know who actually managed it. It wasn't me. Um, but that's the only one I knew of, that I know of. Uh, there may be, if there is anything on maybe groups.io, um, I'm not aware of it if there is. So no, there's no forum that I know of for active discussion of, of uh, the Callisto. So for the moment, it's just my Facebook site where you can put questions or remarks and follow the immediate observations. Okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions for Christian? Norman, you're muted. Unmute. Hi, everybody. Hi. Just on oh. a social point, I like the idea of having a gastronomic celebration to uh, to go along with any physical discoveries and confirmations yeah you, you know uh, even if you are a scientist or an engineer you have to live while doing astronomy so food mm -hmm. and of course beer is essential to survive i can <laughs> say that a few weeks ago with a friend lawrence newell we had a first flight in radio terms or electromagnetic terms of our, uh, well, the word escapes me at the moment, ELF transmissions for human resonance. Human resonance, yeah. At kilohertz um, or hertz range. It's, we've got a long way to go yet, but we did celebrate with a beer at lunchtime. <laughs> So we're going to continue the, the celebrationary trail. And it's... perhaps in a year or so, I'll have a story to tell about the journey of detecting the Schumann resonance. And a picture of you all drinking the beer. <laughs> oh, of course. For your presentation. Next thing that to go with a beer is a bacon butty. <laughs> sounds, better that... than, sounds better than a whale butty. Yeah, Ooh. but... That's not to everybody's taste. <laughs> yeah, whale is not great. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, in the olden days, we would all uh, 
give you an applause, but it's not quite so easy um, on Zoom. But thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. It was a pleasure for me. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, I'd like to invite Callum to take over. We've got a few words to share with us. Callum. Uh, right, can you hear me okay? Yes, and see you. And see me, yeah, I, I think you can see me. I can't tell whether you could hear me or not. I upgraded my computer this week, so uh, it's, uh, it's all gone quite well, but um, let me uh, share my screen for presentation. If I can find it, let's try that one. That works. So can you see that okay? So um, this was a little um, project I started a little bit after uh, Wits uh, excellent talk a few months back about magnetometers and measuring the Earth's magnetic field. So something that I had in the back of my mind for quite a long time was a project uh, to build a magnetometer. Uh, and uh, it spurred me into to action to actually have a go at one. Um, so um, this is the block diagram of the uh, project I came up with. So um, using one of the standard uh, uh, Fluxgate magnetometer sensors, um, which generates a, a, a varying frequency signal. Um, and I thought maybe I can just measure that using a, using a Pico or a Pi. Or a pi uh, and uh, communicate that to a pi, another Pi to do the... Uh, uh, data logging, basically. Um, and then I thought I'll put in a temperature sensor to measure the temperature of the, uh, uh, where the Fluxgate uh, magnetometer is as well, just to, to, to see what the influence of temperature is on it uh, and see if that gives any guidance. Um, so that was my basic uh, circuit block diagram. Um, so I had a few of these bits already, um, um, but I had to buy one of the, uh, the Fluxgate magnetometers. It's, these are made now in Slovenia, Slovakia, um, one, one of the two, uh, a company called fgsensors.com um, make them. Uh, and they, they seem to be quite equivalent to the old speak uh, devices, um, pretty much, seem to have pretty much the same characteristics. Um, had Pi Zero uh, sitting on the shelf, I bought a couple of Raspberry Pi Picos, uh, and I uh, decided to build my own little power supply to, uh, to drive it all. Um, so this was a very crude implementation, and, and this is it sitting on my um, window ledge in my office, which is where it's still sitting right at, right at this, this moment. Um, so um, uh, where's, the, uh, where's the point three thing? Uh, there we go. Um, so that's the Pico there. So this is the sensor um, uh, driving into the, the Pico, uh, and that's the Pi Zero uh, headless, uh, just uh, running uh, standalone completely, really. And, and this is my crude power supply, which I put together, having never done any electronics for uh, for years, I mean, probably. But it all seemed to work okay. Um, so um, there was a question about whether to um, um, convert the frequency to a voltage and then measure the voltage or just to measure the frequency. So I decided to just have a go at measuring the frequency. Um, so I did a bit of a hunt around for other projects that have done that. And there were a few pies, pie, uh, Raspberry Pi implementations where they use clocks to divide down the frequency to a manageable level so you could actually count it and, and, and measure it in the uh, in the Pi. But I didn't really want to build all that extra circuitry. Um, so I hunted around for some Pi uh, Pico code uh, and found uh, an excellent um, uh, resource on the uh, Raspberry Pi forums uh, for a, a thing as described as a reciprocal pulse counter. Uh, pulse counter, which is basically a frequency counter. Uh, and uh, so I thought I'd give that code a go. And um, it, it worked uh, 
very nicely. So when and as it came out the out the can, basically it just uh, continually uh, uh, sent the frequency uh, measurement on the standard output, so you could see what it was. Um, I um, modified that code just to use the UART comms uh, between the Pico uh, and the Pi Zero, just to just continuously streams a measurement of the frequency. <coughs> I also had to um, tweak the uh, um, basically the sampling rate so that the uh, it would slow down a bit because um, I found that the the, the, the Pico was generating and too fast to commute too fast comms for the uh, the Pi Zero to keep up or there was something going wrong between the two and it was running running fast so I slowed it down a bit but it's still um, measuring at about one sample a second so it seems to be a, a pretty good um, uh, compromise. Um, this is the code. It uses um, state machines in, uh, in MicroPython. And whilst I've got a basic understanding of what it does, um, I would be struggling to even start to write one of these myself. So um, it was a, a very handy piece of code that uh, these, this guy and another guy on the uh, Raspberry Pi forums had, had, had implemented it. Um, uh, and it works really well. Um, so on Pi Zero, I've got uh, I've written some code. It's all in Python. Uh, a couple of processes to do the logging. So there's a temperature logger and the, the magnetic uh, measurement, uh, magnetic frequency measurement logger. Um, those capture the, uh, the samples and store them off in a log file, which is uh, created every day and, and gets dependent every day. Um, and then I've got a little web server app. Uh, using Flask, which is the Python uh, web server framework, uh, which makes it very easy to write simple um, uh, web front end to, to, to anything, basically. Um, so this is the, basically the, a bit of the logger code. Um, probably won't be able to read that, but um, um, it's all pretty simple stuff, really. Um, hardest part was 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 coping with the, the switch over at midnight and uh, uh, and, and handling the, the file changes and creation um, I measure all the timestamps and fits time format just to uh, sort of th thoughts about making this a bit more generic perhaps in the future um, it's only about 65 lines of code so it's all all pretty simple stuff really um, the website code that uses uses Flask, as I said earlier. It's a very small piece of HTML code, um, some CSS for the, the pretty buttons and things, and then um, Python for the chart chart generation using mplotlib and, and dashtrapy. Um, so this is basically the Flask, the main Flask application, um, which relies on a, a thing called routing. So um, when you do have, give a web server an address like like um, well, my my local server slash um, that is uh, will execute this piece of code here. I also have a route called display, which is going to display a particular date and provide it with a, a date um, format um, on on the URL as well. Uh, and then it will just do all the processing that you want, uh, and that's all written in Python. And then when you want to send that to um, your web browser. Um, there's what's called a re render template, which is what calls the, the H, uh, or fills out the HTML really, and then you can pass lots of parameters into the HTML, uh, and um, it all, all works really quite easily. Um, this is the actual plot generation. Again, it's pretty simple stuff, um, just using the standard matplotlib stuff to um, um, just reading the CSV files and uh, and, uh, and and doing the X Y plot. Uh, and this is the HTML file. It's uh, again, it's very small, very few lines, a um, couple of lines for the images, and then a few buttons just to to make it act. And, and this is the basic um, web page as it, as it comes up. So um, if there isn't any image generated for a plot it comes up the little um, image saying no image. Um, if there isn't a data file behind it, it will come up with a, a no data uh, image. Um, there's a button to generate the, uh, the plots. 
um, and then there's just day navigators to, to move forward and backwards uh, through the day and then there's a stay button to, to go back to today in case you get lost at which, which day you're at. Um, of course you can always just type in the date into the URL so it would be display 2021 07 20 say to go back a couple of days um, and then it would just just display the, the data for that date. Um, I don't generate automatically. I was took the I took the decision to that you always would do that on pressing the button. Um, obviously, you could do that automatically, but I wasn't sure what the performance hit on the, the Raspberry Pi Zero would be if I was doing that on refreshes and things. So I decided just to uh, make it an action on the button. Um, here's a couple of plots. Um, um, a couple of days ago, um, this bottom plot is the temperature um, in centigrade, so it went up to about 28, 29 um, in the middle of the afternoon. Um, so this is in my my office and, and the, the thing by sitting by the by the window, uh, and this is the uh, the frequency output from the uh, counted by the Pico. Uh, and uh, it's pretty quiet until I get into the office and then it goes a bit bananas whilst I'm in the office, has a little break there whilst I'm at lunch, uh, and then it goes a bit bananas again whilst I'm working in the afternoon. Um, but it does follow the, uh, the, the overall um, um, profile of the, the temperature as well, so uh, that's uh, something I need to, to sort out. Um, so this was a quiet day, this was a it was a Sunday where I wasn't in the office at all, um, and so this is the temperature plot, and this is the uh, uh, magnetic signal plot, and there's a couple of blips in there which aren't due to the um, temperature, so uh, possibly those are some things which will be of, would be of interest, but uh, I also need to keep this, uh, this range down a bit more so that I start seeing more of the, the effect of the Earth's magnetic field on the, on the plot. Uh, so that was a Sunday, uh, last Sunday, uh, and then this is just the uh, um, just the actual plot. So being just image files, you can just uh, save them from the from the web page and post them anywhere else or, or wherever else you want to put them. Um, alternatively, you could grab them onto a public uh, web server and uh, post them to the internet uh, uh, on a public website automatically, uh, as would be all quite possible. So um, next steps, I want to try and bury the sensor in the garden somewhere where it will be a bit more uh, stable temperature and uh, uh, will be a magnetically quiet place. Um, I've got a spot thought about in the garden where I can put it and I think the only effect would be I get the, the lawnmower out probably and uh, um, go back nearby, but ho hopefully that will be uh, a good place to put it. Uh, and um, maybe do some minor software tweaks, maybe put in a calendar and uh, something like that. And that's what I've got in mind anyway. So um, that's it really, hope that's been of interest. Um, if you're interested in any of the things I've done and you want to follow up, then just send me an email and I'm quite happy to try and answer any questions anyone's got right now. Alan, how much are the uh, Luxgate uh, um, devices? Um, I th think it was of the region of 35 euros. Um, so I only bought the one. I did think about buying two. Um, and then I thought if I just buy one, then that avoids any import problems because it's under like the 45 quid or whatever the the um the import duty thing is from from eu countries now um but of course you're paying if you're buying two and did them as two orders you'd pay the postage twice so perhaps it's not much <laughs> not much of an, an economy um but um yeah it's about but they're about i think they're about 30 to 40 euros somewhere in that area it um Callum, it, look, it looks like um you could do quite a um a useful job of um, subtracting the temperature uh, from from the other data to 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 see see the magnetic mm. variation. That would yeah, be yeah, I, th I think I'll have a go at that once I've got more stable. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. They say when you stabilize the 
temperature it might not be quite so prevalent but it would might be an interesting exercise and it would be mm. pretty easy to do in uh, yeah um, using uh using numpy or something yeah 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 uh, I, I did notice you know there's quite my put a cup of tea like, near the uh on the window ledge which had a, had a spoon in it i don't um i noticed this blip in the uh is that the way it goes up quite suddenly? Mm. The, uh, it wasn't in it. Not it wasn't in one of those plots. Ah, oh, right. In, in yeah. Another plot. The, the 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 signal went. Actually, it went to the floor, and I thought, "What's going on here?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, you <laughs> mean the metal spoon? That, that it stopped working. Yeah. <laughs> it was only because I put a metal spoon inside my 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 had still had metal spoon in my teacup, and uh, um, yeah, so it was it was sort of very sensitive to that respect. So I think a lot of the the interference is just because I'm working. Yeah. My, computer and switching it on and off. And but there's clearly a very, on. very uh, big correlation between the temperature and... and yeah, yeah, there is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Have, have you considered actually calibrating it against temperature? So sort of isolating it magnetically in a, in a, in a known field and then just warming it up and seeing what happens? No, I'm, 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 I'm hoping once I get to a fair, if I can get to a fairly stable temperature, I won't have to worry about calibrating against temperature that's um, maybe easier said than done of course <laughs> probably yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i had thought about actually doing a proper calibration magnetic calibration but that looks quite difficult as well so I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I, might, I might come back to that i'm sure there are, there are ways of doing that but uh... yeah i'm sure it's a standard thing uh, and there must be uh, um it must be fairly straightforward. Um, I, 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 the, um, the, the, the measurements should change by about 500 hertz across a, a, a large sort of uh, electromagnetic disturbance. Um, and uh, on those plots, uh, uh, so that's, um, that's 66 to 67 kilohertz, uh, 66 to 67 kilohertz there. So that's about, um, so you'd expect to see a, a swing of, of, of around about that sort of much for, a, for an electromagnetic disturbance uh, uh, in, uh, for a real one, uh, for a large one, but probably presumably for smaller ones, it'll just be small swings in the, um, in the tens of hertz or, or hundreds of hertz region. Um, so I'm also wondering about what the stability of the frequency measurement is over over time. But um, the um, the guys that uh, wrote the codes um, um, seem to think that it was pretty stable uh, for the Pico code. Can you put your um, email address back up again, Alex? So I'd be quite interested in in the code. Mm. I I uh, the, uh, but, uh, but the little assembler routine for sampling looked quite quite uh, quite neat actually. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really clever. That, <laughs> it uses three state machines and, and basically creates a gate pulse and um, uh, and then then measures the, the input frequency against a, a gate and. Um, it just um, did it in straight uh, sampler rather than using the um, using yeah. the actual um, um, I forgot the name of the thing you know the the little um, uh, the, the the other processor, um, but um, uh, yeah, but. It's be uh, interesting to. Um, I've not actually written anything yet using the Pico's. Um, uh, um, what's it called? Um, PIO. PIO. Yeah, yeah. I've not actually. I've, I've sort of, you know, um, I've, I've um, downloaded a few bits of uh, of code and run them, but I haven't really written anything myself yet because it's mm. uh, it's going back about thirty five years since I did an assembler, so it's. Uh, it looks yeah, um, it looks like it's got quite a quite a good potential because the you know you can sample at quite a decent rate with it. Mm, yeah, I mean that that's the the um, running at full speed. Um, they were saying that they could get up to um, multi megahertz measurement yeah. frequency, yeah. Uh, and and also down to very low frequencies as well. One of the guys had adapted it to go very low. Um, and, and this seems to be getting good accuracy compared to um, sort of proper frequency counters that are uh, used in parallel to, to, to test things out. Mm. Yeah, it's remarkable for a, something that costs less than four quid, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll contact you then. Thank yeah, you. sure thing. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, Callum. That was yeah. that was very interesting. Um, it's just it's a, it's a great example of how the poster session can be used. Um, you must come back again sometime when you've um, buried the magnetometer in your garden. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'll uh, I'll uh, if if and when I get any any results, I'll uh, I'll let you know. Yeah, once um, it's once it's stable. Um, I had a discussion with John Cook all oh, maybe a year ago now about calibrating. I was on the about to embark on a construction of a Helmholtz coil to try to calibrate a magnetometer. And, um, and he said that uh, what, what one could do is uh, when, well, once there's an event that a number of people have measured, then have a look at the, uh, magni the magnitude and use that to scale off the calibration in um, nanotesla. So that's that, that's what I did. So it's not an absolute calibration, but it's um it's kind of a good enough because it's only relative changes that you're interested in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's why I was really worried about making it um, um going for a proper calibration at the moment. I I wonder whether that Helmholtz coil technique would be a way of um, slowly cooking your magnetometer to see what happens. <laughs> You only need quite a small current to, to generate sufficient magnetic field in the in the most coils for for calibration. I think. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much, Callum. Um, and to conclude the evening, I'm going to invite Andrew Thomas to address us. Andrew. Right. Unmute myself. Um, Nothing so interesting as what we've just heard, I'm afraid. Um, just a few words um, about uh, on behalf of Eucra tonight. Um, we're very interested at the moment in finding some new volunteers to help us out, which is uh, my primary purpose. If anyone fancies uh, giving us a hand, sort of make, making things or um, building things that would be uh, we'd be quite interested to hear to hear from you um we've got a couple of we're having starting to have some thoughts about some uh, new products and instead of the you know to supplement and go along with the ones we've currently let me just share that i can't talk and good um we've got currently got on the go um and the other thing was, well, I was kind of interested in what people would like to spend their money on. Now, if anyone's going to suggest we should start building 10 metre dishes and supplying them fully installed, well, I don't think we're quite up to that. But if anybody's you know, got ideas of what would be useful to the independent researcher or interesting, um, I'd be happy to, happy to have a chat. So anybody who you know fancies making some electronics or can do a bit of um, mechanical fitting or software soft, software as a hobby, we we don't actually we've never sold software, and I'm not sure we're really intending intending to. But uh, a way to share it would be a a very interesting way to go. So Paul offered me this. Uh, opportunity to have a little re recruitment advert um, and there there it is uh, say so nothing so interesting as what we've just heard from um, Callum and about Ecolisto. Thank you very much gentlemen thank you for your uh, indulgence. Yeah that's that's great um, Andrew thanks very much. Um, it, it, does anybody want to follow up on that? I have to say that Eucra is a, a valuable resource in in, um, in in getting people started. Uh, the magnetometer from Eucra was the first instrument that I uh, installed and uh, and got working, and then followed up with some other stuff as well. So it it, it is a fantastic um, resource. If anybody um, wants to respond to Andrew, then uh, please, please contact him or me. Could I, could I just respond to Rod, Rodney um, very briefly about undergraduate projects? Um, we've certainly had a couple of universities use our kit and use some 
um, archived data that we have available about SID's observations for precisely the kind of things he's described, um, an opportunity for students to, to build something, collaborate, some building, some software, some data analysis um, in a relatively simple, you know, the, the, kit, the kit kind of works, it generates data, it's a fairly known, known, known event and it's sometimes quite nice to get students to actually get hands on and make something rather than just stare, staring at screens all day. I, I think they still enjoy that sort of thing. They should do. We want them to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I'll be following this up. I'll be looking at uh, your, um, your website for a start. Yeah, give us, a, give us an email. Um, pick, pick up on that, on, on that elsewhere. I, I might yeah. contact you as well, Rodney. So, um, um, myself and, uh, and Paul Hyde and a few others are working on a, a project where there's some sort of machine learning requirements. Which ah, now maybe, you're talking. Yeah. Um, okay, I should explain. I'm at the Open University as a, uh, a fairly full-time tutor. And we are um, we're looking to expand our what should we call it uh, RF engineering, if you like, and and, uh, hmm. and similar activities. And radio astronomy, I think, is going to, would be very popular with uh, a lot of OU students doing um, final year dissertations and also master of science, master of science, space science, and technology. Hmm. So. Um, and I'm completely new to this group, so you know I'm still searching, finding out who knows what. And... Yeah, we're doing some stuff with um, uh, meter detection, and um, yeah. and so we're we're looking at um, using um, some um, uh, machine learning to try and filter out the uh, the, the well to to, to perform mm. some of the um, uh, counting and measurements automatically because uh, wow, um, yeah, they're, they're that all, is uh, leading edge. That yeah, sounds well, like good stuff. Yeah, it's um, it's all pretty doable with modern, um, you know, with some of the modern um, systems like, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, machine learning um, hmm. things that's, that's out yeah. there. And, um, hmm. Tiny ML. Yeah, Tiny ML is one of them, yeah. and and, um, and 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 Google's um, um, TensorFlow um, yes. is a hot, yeah. hot contender. I've been playing with TensorFlow using um, the uh, the Jets Nano, and um, and it's amazing what you can do, mm. um, uh, very inexpensively. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot to do there. But um, we've, I'd be interested to talk to you about it because it's uh, it's really um, sort of the, in the on the edge of my capabilities. But uh, um, it would be great for a for an undergraduate to get the T. Okay, into. stick your um, email address in the chat box. Right, I will. There you go. Yep, got it. Thank you. There is some good information in the chat box tonight. Um, in, it now would be a good time to save it because I think once the meeting's closed, it's it disappears. Oh, it disappears. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, I'll, I'll have it. So if anybody misses it, then do contact me and I can um, mail it out. Yeah, but, um, I've, forgotten, I've forgotten how to do that. Is it's it just under a file? Little, little, there's a three dots in the bottom right of it. Yeah. It's, it's, and you click on that and it says... Uh, oh, yeah. Say chat. Yeah, that's yeah. it. I'm not quite sure where it saves it. You'll have to hunt it down later. But uh... Uh, It's documents. I think right. it's my documents and then... Zoom that creates its own directory, and then all the stuff yeah. about this yeah. meeting will go into that directory. What a fantastic evening, gentlemen and ladies. Um, do we have any more comments? Any other questions? Nope. Nope. Okay. Right. Well, um, enjoy your summer. We'll be back in September, and very likely there'll be a training seminar a one-off in August to pick up questions relating to your Python headaches. Great. Good night, one and all. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much, everybody.
Good night. Thanks. Good night. Great stuff. Well done. Good night, everybody.